Chapter 9 The Special One It's not often you can say with conviction that someone has changed your life, but I know it's true of Jose Mourinho. In fact, I knew very soon after I met him that he was unique. Someone whose personality, ambition and ability to instill belief in others made him inspirational. People mock him for claiming to be special. I would advise against it. Look at what he's already achieved in his relatively short career in football. I saw his introduction as Chelsea manager on television the same as everyone else. Myself, JT, Bridgie and Joe Cole were holed up in the England team hotel in Manchester preparing for Euro 2004 when Mourinho exploded into our lives. I watched his performance in the press conference at Stamford Bridge and thought he came across as arrogant and very confident. But I don't have a problem with that when someone has the medals in their locker to back it up. It wasn't his Champions League, UEFA Cup and Portuguese title wins which swayed me though. Once I met him, I knew he was the real thing. I had two conversations with him that summer of 2004, which convinced me that I was dealing with a man who knew what he wanted and knew how to achieve it. The unshakable self-belief, which is his trademark, can have a very powerful effect on those he believes are of a similar mind. He can be intimidating, but he also has a charm which is just as disarming. I began to understand him when we were in America on a pre-season tour that July. Training was varied and enjoyable, and his likeable character made the lads comfortable. Nevertheless, I wasn't prepared for what happened after practice. I was last in the shower, and turning to leave when I was stopped in my tracks by the manager. There was a moment of silence as I waited for him to move, but he looked me in the eye and I realised he had something to say. All right, boss, I asked, wondering what I'd done to invite an audience. You are the best player in the world, he said, without blinking. I was slightly confused, as well as completely naked. Talk about feeling vulnerable. You, he said more forcefully, are the best player in the world. Oh, thanks, boss, I replied cautiously. I was unsure if he was telling me this to boost my confidence. I knew that I wasn't the best player in the world, and the only indication I had that he rated me was second-hand, or from the complimentary way he spoke to me in training sessions. He sensed a misunderstanding and made himself very clear. Listen, a year ago, Deco was a fantastic player, but now... He's in line to win the European Footballer of the Year. Why do you think that is? I will tell you. A year ago, he was the same player, but now he has won the Champions League and the Portuguese title with Porto, and he's proved he is one of the best. You are just as good as Zidane, Vieira or Deco, and now all you have to do is win things. You are the best player in the world, but now you need to prove it and win trophies. You understand? OK, boss. I knew what he meant, but I also felt a bit embarrassed. I wanted to get out of the shower and out of the conversation as quickly as I could. He had elevated me to a new level, and I felt a massive surge in confidence. I was walking on air for the rest of that day, and I called Mum to tell her what Mourinho had said. Yes, she replied nonchalantly. I already knew you were the best in the world. I felt ten feet tall and trained harder than ever over the next couple of days. Everything I tried came off, passes, shots, even a couple of headers. We played Celtic in Seattle on the Saturday in our first game under the new boss. The city was experiencing its hottest summer for 83 years and it was more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit when I jogged out as a second-half sub. That's all right. No problem to the best player in the world except that I had an absolute stinker. I mishit passes, mistimed tackles and felt sluggish. I came off the pitch feeling a right mug. I couldn't face the manager. How could I? He told me I was the best player in the world 
and I just played 45 minutes looking more Sunday League than Champions League. He didn't say a word. Well, not until a whole year later, when we were in New York the following pre-season. He came up to me during training. Lamps, remember that game against Celtic in Seattle last summer? He asked. Yeah, I was complete shit, wasn't I? Yes, you were. You couldn't even pass three yards. We laughed, and he put his hand on my shoulder. Togetherness and team spirit came easily and in abundance under Mourinho. If I had a pound for every time someone has asked me for the secret of his success, then maybe I'd have enough money to pay him to tell me. All I can say is that he has an intuitive understanding of the way people work, of their dreams and desires, and how to harness that energy and convert it into a winning formula. There's no one big thing he's done, no Mourinho magic which turns everything to gold. Instead, it's the little things that count. Things like instigating a huddle in the changing room before we take the field for a game. JT came up to me the afternoon of that first match with Celtic and told me the plan. The gaffer said he wants me to get everyone round and I have to give a speech before the match, John said. What am I going to say, geezer? I don't know, I replied unhelpfully. I'm not sure I like the sound of that. It's embarrassing. Thank fuck you're up first. Yeah, but you'll be next, so we better work it out, geez. But it's only Celtic and pre-season. It doesn't matter. We're all just trying to get fit today. That don't matter, mate. I'm telling you, he wants it to start today. All we could be sure about was that the speech should conclude with the question, Who are we? And the shouted response, Chelsea. It still felt very strange when the time came to get into the huddle. JT was great. He set the tone with a real rant about winning, mixed with a lot of effing and blinding. My contributions have been a bit less boisterous, but between us all, we made it work in our favour, and it was the beginning of a very special camaraderie, which has got stronger. Within a few weeks of entering our lives, Mourinho had taken us from being a talented group with the potential to win major honours, to a team which would settle for nothing less. I wasn't surprised. From the moment I saw him handle the media on his first day at Chelsea, I knew that there was something which set him apart from everyone else. That opinion was clearly not shared by the non-Chelsea lads at the England team hotel. I headed for the dining room, and Mourinho's appearance on telly was the talk of the tables. His swaggering style had certainly made an impression, and I learned immediately that I had a manager who grabbed people's attention. See your new gaffer on the telly? I was asked a few times by some of the players. It was then followed by, Who the fuck does he think he is? I wasn't affected by this response. I understood their reaction. It was, after all, the same as that of the general public. But I'm drawn to individuals who have real character, and I didn't feel threatened. My only concern at that stage was what he thought about me. Before Mourinho's appointment, Didier Deschamps had been in the frame to succeed Ranieri and had been very complimentary about me, which selfishly made me wonder if he might be the best candidate. By contrast, there had been only silence from Mourinho. I'd been preparing myself for his arrival, though. A friend in the press called me a couple of days earlier and told me it was definitely him. Fine. He was articulate and well presented, and of course, he just won the European Cup. Now I just had to wait to talk to him. The wait was short. Ericsson came to me after the meal and said that the new Chelsea manager was on his way to Manchester and wanted to meet me. Not you then, Sven, I thought fleetingly. JT, Coley, Bridgie and I were shown to a room in the hotel and waited. We were all nervous. We had seen a stranger describe himself as the special one, and he was our new boss. What was I supposed to say to him? I'd heard that he was very methodical and would call a team meeting to discuss the finest detail of planning for a match. My experience of that style of management before was with the England under-21s when Howard Wilkinson was in charge. Wilkinson would call meetings about meetings about meetings. 
it was very boring and ultimately pointless. Being tactical and organised is something I believe is very important, but there has to be balance. The door opened, and in came Peter Kenyon, Roman Abramovich, Eugene Tenenbaum, and then Mourinho. I thought he would be very serious, but he smiled and shook hands with us in a very friendly and informal way, putting us at ease. I noticed a twinkle in his eye, which suggested he was excited about the adventure he had just signed up for. Kenyon spoke first, introducing Mourinho. And saying a few words about how the club was going to go forward, I hardly heard him. His speech barely registered with me. My focus was on Mourinho, who sat back in his chair, looking extremely comfortable. I was on the edge of mine, literally. It's a pleasure to be here, Mourinho began. I wanted to come and meet you, because you are the English heart of Chelsea, and a very important part of the team, and I want you to be even more so. For my team, this will be a very exciting time for all of us. We will bring in some new players, but I wanted to come here to tell you myself that all of you will be major players next season. I've seen what you've done so far, and I think you are capable of more. With me as coach, we will achieve that together. He then spoke to Coley directly. The rest of us were all established, but Joe had been in and out of the team, and had had a difficult first year at the club. I look back now and realise how perceptive Mourinho was. He realised that Coley was the one of the four who needed most encouragement. I know how I want to play you, and how I can get the best out of you, he said. I have good experience of making a skilful player work for the team. I did it at Porto. And、I'm sure we can do this together at Chelsea. We chatted for a few minutes, and then Mourinho signalled that it was time to go. He had, however, one final point to make. I need to know that you are winners. It was a rhetorical question, but the brief silence was followed by a nodding of heads and "Yes, boss," all round. Good, because I am a winner, and now so are you. We will win things together, and with that, he stood up, shook us by the hand, and walked out of the room. Eugene and Roman smiled proudly. They knew they had the right man for the job, and so did we. I didn't see him again until after the European Championships, though I know he came to watch all of England's games. I was relieved when he gave an interview during that period, saying that he wanted to build the midfield around me. There had been a lot of chat about Porto's Portuguese players, Costinha and Deco, arriving at Chelsea, so this reassurance was welcome. Harlington was a different place when I returned from holiday after Euro 2004. Mourinho had asked for huge nets to be installed behind the goals, and we had ball boys around the practice pitch. Previously, I would have run to collect a ball myself. Simple things, but very effective. There was a rule book which he distributed, but he was careful to point out that the one rule he expected us all to adhere to more than any other was to behave as a professional footballer should. John and I had been appointed as captain and vice captain of the club while we were in the States, and it became clear that I would have more interaction with Mourinho than I'd been used to with any previous manager. Ranieri was never one to consult the players very much, but soon. J.T. and I were being asked our opinion on possible transfer targets, as well as the details of the training structure. Before he signed a new centre back, he called us to see him and explained that he'd identified four possible players: one was English, one Italian, a South American, and Ricardo Carvalho. John and I knew Carvalho from the European Championships and reckoned he was very good. But Mourinho was tentative about bringing in too many Portuguese. We told him he should just buy the best. At first, I was wary about this level of involvement with management. I'd been used to talking with Dad when he was assistant manager at West Ham, and remember him coming home on a few occasions, telling stories of players trying to tell him and Harry their job. We had that so and so in the office today. He would say, 
telling us we should buy this player and that player. Who the fuck does he think he is? I seem to remember Paolo Di Canio's name being mentioned a lot in these conversations. This was a very different culture from what we were used to. Maybe Paolo was accustomed to it, but for John and me, being asked to give an opinion on everything was completely new. Team food also changed. We'd been accustomed to a strict diet of pasta, salad, fish and chicken, with nothing sweet or unhealthy. Now, we had all of those things, but also cookies for dessert and even Coca-Cola. Players appreciate being treated as adults, and Marino gives you the option. You can take the right route or the wrong route, but if you take the wrong route, he'll know about it, and there will be repercussions. Some people chose to see how far they could push him. Hernan Crespo failed to turn up on time for the first day's training, despite the fact Mourinho had called him to assure him that he was first-choice striker. A deal was quickly agreed to send him on loan to AC Milan. Everyone was well aware of what had happened. A line had been drawn, and above it was an important message. Don't mess with the manager. Those who crossed the line found their career at Chelsea short-lived. Veron and Mutu were two other high-profile signings from the previous year who didn't survive. Seba went on loan to Inter Milan and never came back, while Adrian was already well on his way to going off the rails. Ironically, Mourinho had decided to get rid of him until Crespo pissed him off, and so Mutu was granted a reprieve. He had arrived as part of the Abramovich revolution, and seemed like a decent lad, even though sometimes he had that can't-be-bothered attitude about him. In the first few games of the 2003-2004 season, he looked very impressive, showing an ability to score goals with either foot, he had a bit of front about him as well, a cheek which came through in the presence of people he wanted to impress or get attention from. The most obvious was Mr Abramovich. When he came into the dressing room after games, most players were respectful and friendly towards the owner of the club. Mutu behaved differently. Ah, boss, boss, he would shout as soon as he saw him. How's that yacht sailing? I mean, yachts. And he would laugh loudly until he saw Mr Abramovich break into a smile. Quite often, Mutu would usher Mr Abramovich into a corner where they would chat more quietly. I have no idea what they talked about, but it seemed friendly enough. This was shortly after the buyout of the club, and I think the new owner enjoyed being treated like one of the boys, though I could tell from the way he looked at Mutu that he knew exactly what was going on. Quite often, Mutu would bring up the subject of bonuses for the players, and Roman would smile at him, even though it was a bit embarrassing. I'm sure he had rarely come across anyone like Mutu before, or at least anyone like him that he directly employed. It was hardly the most subtle way to ask for a raise, but to Mutu it was all part of a big act. He loved that. He was an extrovert who was rarely content if he wasn't the focus of attention. Despite his fooling around, Mutu was also a clever politician when it came to selecting the people he would befriend. I didn't talk to him much, but Mutu certainly made a point of singling out the players he felt had influence. Marcel, JT and Franco were people I would often see him chatting with about the team, the way we were playing and so on. He was cute that way. When he won Romania's Player of the Year, there was a private plane to ferry him to Bucharest for the ceremony, and he invited Marcel, JT and Mario Melchior along for the night out. It was interesting to see him work the dressing room. We had a couple of team outings, and Mutu would turn up in his urban terrorist gear, wearing enough chains around his neck to give most gangster rappers a run for their rhyme-gotten gains. He didn't stop there. He was happy to find a podium or posing post in the club where he could watch everyone around him watch him. I stayed near the relative sanity of the bar, chatting with a few mates, but before you knew it, Mutu, smoking a big cigar, had taken over a table and was surrounded by women. Lamps! Lamps! Come to the table! he shouted over. I just thought, this lad knows how to live. It's fair to say, Adrian liked to party. I didn't think much of it then, because he was still new at Chelsea and playing well. 
There was nothing to suggest he wouldn't be a valuable addition to the squad, but then his form dropped quite quickly and the goals dried up. Then he was injured and only appeared very irregularly in the team. During that time, Mutu's social life began to get out of hand. He seemed drawn to excess. It was evident in the way he behaved around people. And the story of his two cars is a good illustration of his careless attitude when it came to his reputation. He bought two Porsche 911s when he signed for the club. A blue one he used to come to training in during the week and a black one which he preferred for weekends. Unfortunately, his apartment in Chelsea Harbour only came with one parking space and so he took to parking the one he wasn't using on a yellow line outside knowing it would be impounded. At the end of the week, he would give one of the trainee pros the 400 quid or so needed to get his car out of the pound and bring it back to Chelsea Harbour. This went on for a few weeks before someone at the club got wind of it and told Mutu to sort it out before it became a story for the tabloids. When a high-profile footballer is behaving like that, it's only a matter of time before they'll make the headlines. Mutu was a scandal waiting to happen. Scott Parker lived near Mutu at Chelsea Harbour for a while. Scotty is the ultimate professional, never late and always well prepared. But on occasion, he would travel to Harlington with Mutu. One morning, he bumped into Mutu as he was coming out of the lift in their building. Mutu looked rough and had obviously enjoyed a good night. So good, he was just getting in. He begged Scotty to wait for him while he got changed into his training gear. Scotty agreed as long as he was straight back down and, amazingly, Mutu appeared and the two of them made it on time. It wasn't the first time Mutu had come straight from a night out to the training ground. The lad started noticing that he would manage half a session or less and then complain that he felt a muscle strain or another minor injury. He'd head into the dressing room, struggling from a lack of energy and nothing else. I'd seen it before with Mark Bosnich, who had drifted out of the team and lost interest in training and playing. He started hanging around with a certain crowd in a particular social scene and had changed as a person. I'd always got on well with Bozo, but it got to the stage when I didn't recognise the one-time happy-go-lucky guy who used to give me a lift to training when I first signed. I never knew for sure that he was doing cocaine and never actually saw him take drugs. But when you come in from training and find your reserve goalie fast asleep on the massage table, fully dressed, you realise something's wrong. He wasn't knackered from exercise and it got so bad that I even remember having a conversation with Ranieri while Bozo snored in the background. It was the same with Mutu in that I didn't know for sure he was using cocaine. I'd heard a couple of rumours about it and noticed he was becoming more and more erratic. It was obvious that he was more interested in playing the field than playing on it. His mood became changeable. One day he would look very rough and blank you. The next he would be fine and as boisterous as ever. When the story leaked that he'd tested positive for cocaine I wasn't exactly shocked. I've no idea what the extent of his involvement with drugs was, but what was clear to anyone was that his hectic social life was impacting on his ability to play football, and I wasn't sorry to see him leave the club. We didn't miss him. Mourinho had impressed on us from the beginning his decision to change the basic formation from 4-4-2 to 4-3-2-1. He wanted to break the lines up and make the team more fluid. It was actually more of a diamond to start with, but the system evolved to the point where I moved from the front of the diamond to the left side of the midfield three. The pressure built steadily leading up to the first league match of the season against Manchester United, even more than in the first season of Mr Abramovich's ownership. Now we had a special manager and more new players, and the expectation had increased in line with the spending. Seven new signings. Drogba, Carvalho, Ferreira, Kejman, Robin, Thiago and Czech had arrived for a cool £82 million. Not bad for one summer. Just for good measure, 
the media had dubbed the contest the manager's rematch because of the Champions League tie the previous season, in which Mourinho's Porto had eliminated United at Old Trafford, causing something of a disagreement between our new boss and Sir Alex Ferguson. Mourinho called a team meeting the day before the match. We'd already discussed our tactics and were very well drilled on what to expect and what was expected from us. But the boss had a more important message to convey. You will read in the press and hear in the media me saying that I don't expect us to win the league in my first season, he said. I want you to be very clear that I've said this only to keep the pressure off all of us. I also want you to know that I do expect us to win the Premiership this season. I know that we will. We are winners and winning is all that matters. I don't want to be second or third. We want to win this league and we will. I felt myself draw a sharp breath. No more of the Ranieri method of focus on performance and improve on last season. Winning was everything. New manager, new Chelsea. It was just what we needed. United came to the bridge to take the wind from our sails, but they didn't succeed. It wasn't pretty, but we won the match thanks to a goal from Ida. I didn't play particularly well, and the diamond didn't function properly. We stayed strong, though, and defended sternly as a team, and that was the direction Mourinho wanted us to take. We'd done a lot of work on defending as a unit, and it paid off in that first game. He was cute enough to realise that he couldn't turn us into a fluid attacking unit in seven weeks, so instead he made us hard to beat. In fact, we had defeated one of our title rivals at the first time of asking. It was calculating and it was brilliant. And that was the way we started the campaign until the fourth game when Coley came in and added a bit more flair. Robin and Duff were both injured from pre-season and we would have to wait until November before we saw the new formation in full glorious flow. Until then, we got a lot of stick in the press for being boring and defensive, but the manager never remarked on it to us. He didn't care. I was concerned about my own form, though. Mourinho had invested a lot of faith in me, and I didn't feel I was justifying it over the first two games. A couple of days after the victory at Crystal Palace in the third match, he took me aside and told me that he liked the way I had run the midfield. The ProZone statistics had shown that I was involved in all four of the top passing partnerships in the match. That is what he wanted from me. Industry and involvement. I scored my first goal in the next match against Southampton, and we were undefeated until we went to Manchester City on the 16th of October. People were already asking if we could emulate Arsenal, and go the whole season unbeaten? The answer was no. Nicholas Anelka scored from a penalty, and we lost the match by a single goal. That was it. The bubble had burst, and now it would revert to the same old Chelsea and collapse. Not a chance. Losing was a new experience under Mourinho, and I wondered what reaction it would provoke in him. The answer was simple. None. He told us straight after the game that we'd done enough to win it twice, that we should not be downbeat. It was unrealistic to expect not to suffer one defeat. Just make sure it doesn't happen again. He smiled as he said it, and we understood. Far from being the beginning of our demise, the defeat became the catalyst for our most impressive spell of the campaign. The diamond had evolved to the more familiar 4-3-3, and Robin started to wreak havoc among opposition defences, having returned to the team after injury. Drogba was a powerful presence at the point of attack, and I was running through from midfield to support and scoring more. We embarked on a goal spree, which saw us score 47 times in our next 21 outings. Not bad for a boring defensive team. Our momentum saw our points total soar and the manager sensed that he was now managing his team. He had won our hearts and minds. A new confidence enveloped the squad, and when Mourinho gave an instruction, it was carried out as second nature. 
people began to notice that occasionally he would send a sub on with handwritten notes which would be given to me or John. There was no big secret. The note might contain instructions about who should be marked at corners or how better we could use our formation. Sometimes it would be much more blunt, carrying only the message, Win. We knew what he wanted, because we wanted the same. We were five points ahead of Arsenal when we travelled to Highbury on the 12th of December. They had been leading the Premiership at one stage, but had their unbeaten run ended by Manchester United and then lost their way a bit. Mourinho cleverly transferred the pressure to them when he stated before the match that we needed only a draw. As always, we went there looking for victory. Lads like JT, Ida and I, who'd been at Chelsea a while, were sick of losing to Arsenal in the league. None of us had ever beaten them, and Chelsea had failed to in 14 years of trying. I was tired of feeling that we'd been the best team in those derby matches, but never had much to show for it. This contest would throw up little more joy for Chelsea in that respect, as we were twice down at Highbury, but came back to draw the match. Thierry Henry scored both, though the second was a hotly disputed free kick, which he had taken quickly to beat Petr Cech, who was still arranging our defence. JT and Ida struck back for a moral victory. But more important was that for the first time we began to get the Premiership trophy in our sights. So too did the manager, who from then on regularly pointed out how far ahead we would be if we won this game or that game. He used the building of a lead to motivate us to put more space between ourselves and our rivals. We kept winning. In the past, when we had to get a victory to stay ahead, we would fail. But not now. Over the Christmas period, when we traditionally slipped up, we put together an impressive sequence of results. Portsmouth away, 2-0. Liverpool away, 1-0. Middlesbrough at home. 2-0. We were reaching perfection. The Premiership was not the only competition where we were on a roll. January saw us take on Manchester United in the semi-final of the Carling Cup, which people had mistakenly believed we would have been happy to sacrifice for other honours. Not so, with Mourinho in charge. The first leg at our place was high tempo and hard work. It ended goalless, but the aftermath was not without incident, as our manager told the press he'd seen Sir Alex Ferguson berating referee Neil Barry in the tunnel at half-time. Mourinho then pointed out that the second half had been riddled with free kicks, most of them in United's favour. It was whistle and whistle, fault and fault, cheat and cheat. And not for the first time his words were scrutinised and inevitably used as a rod to beat him. He was charged with improper conduct by the FA and then fined £5,000. The controversy merely fuelled our motivation in the return leg at Old Trafford, but I'd been aware for a while of the changing mood in the media towards Mourinho. I put it down to the fact that we kept winning games and some people were desperate to see us lose a few just to see how the manager would cope. But he kept his cool and ensured that none of the external pressure on him ever found its way into the dressing room. We were still in the hunt for every competition we had entered, and there had been a lot of headlines referring to a possible Grand Slam. It wasn't something any of us had even considered. We hadn't secured our first trophy yet, never mind four of them, and that was the kind of distraction we could do without. I never gave it a thought even after I collected Didier's layoff at Old Trafford and swept a left-foot shot into the net to put us ahead in the Carling Cup return leg. After all of the furore surrounding the first game, it was a sweet moment for us. United, though, are still the benchmark for everyone in English football, and there was no chance of them giving up. Ryan Giggs replied with a great finish to level it, but we weren't finished yet. Duffer caused panic in their defence with five minutes left when he whipped in a free kick and we may have been a little fortunate that it found the net. I couldn't have cared less. You can be the best team in the world but you won't win without a bit of luck. 
we were in the final. The first of the season, our first under Mourinho, and the first for Mr Abramovich. All we had to do now was beat Liverpool. My previous experience of Cardiff's Millennium Stadium was very mixed. The FA Cup final in 2002, in which we lost to Arsenal, was a huge disappointment, though I took some satisfaction from the way I had battled with Vieira and the fact that we had made that stage in my first season with Chelsea. We checked into the St David's Bay Hotel, and John pointed out that it was the same one we had used for the match with Arsenal. He did this, of course, because he's superstitious. A lot of players are afflicted by this strange condition, and I'm not totally immune, though my good luck habits don't extend much beyond wearing the same watch for the next match after a victory. JT is different. In fact, he's unique when it comes to the lengths he'll go to in order to recreate the exact conditions required to keep Lady Luck on his side. From keeping the same seats on the bus to using the same urinal in the dressing room at Stamford Bridge, from pre-match meals to counting lampposts to parking spaces. I dreaded the effect staying in the hotel might have on John, given that he'd woken up with vertigo the morning of the 2002 FA Cup final and only made the bench. I checked his balance first thing the next morning. Perfect. A good omen already. It didn't last into the match, though. Within the first minute... We were a goal down. We threw everything at Liverpool, but nothing worked except a cruel twist of fate. Stevie Gerrard flicked the ball into his own net from a free kick, and the match went to extra time. Ida played alongside Claude Makaleli and me in midfield, and was excellent. People call him versatile, but in fact, he's just a very good footballer. He was the player who impressed me most when I first joined Chelsea. I was in awe of how natural he was with a ball at his feet and how sharply he turned thought into action on the pitch. He was outstanding in that final and when Didi poked a shot under Dudek to put us ahead, I thought it was all over. However, there was more drama left as they equalised and then Ida's shot was spilled to Kejman, who swept it home. The memory of lifting the Carling Cup is sweet, and my winner's medal is precious. We celebrated like you'd expect for a team which had won their first trophy under a new manager, though my favourite moment of the party was Roman lifting the Carling Cup at dinner to drink champagne from it. We all cheered, and I don't think I've ever seen a broader smile on a man. I was content. I had left West Ham for Chelsea to win things, and now, after four years... I'd achieved my first, and definitely not the last. The Champions League was a competition which we felt very strongly about. For most of us, there was a nagging sense of unfinished business after the way we had lost to Monaco the year before. Barcelona was not the ideal draw for the first knockout stage, and not just because they were the most exciting team in Europe. Ronaldinho's skills would be hard to contain, though not as difficult to cope with as the demand for tickets in my house. All of Ellen's relations are Barca fans, and we were expecting a full house, as well as a mini family section at the bridge for the second leg. The first match, however, produced a controversy, the likes of which I have never been involved in. It was as fierce a contest on the pitch as the build-up to it had suggested. Bragging rights and the odd insult had been tossed back and forth, and each side jostled for advantage. Once again, we benefited from an own goal, which saw us take a lead into half-time. Barcelona boss Frank Rijkaard seemed incensed by some of the refereeing, and by the time I reached our dressing room, there was clearly something very wrong. Some of our coaching staff were shouting, while others were pointing to the Barca dressing room accusingly, Mourinho ushered all of us inside and gave his summary of what we needed to do to stay ahead. It was calm enough when we left for the pitch, but all hell broke loose when Didi was sent off within ten minutes of the restart. He'd already been wound up by the antics of Marquez and Puyol, big strong guys, who
who'd been falling too easily in the first half and then protesting that he should be booked. Now it was the turn of their keeper to play up after Didi's innocuous challenge in a 50-50 situation. Barca players surrounded referee Anders Frisk and, sure enough, Didi was red-carded. They scored twice to win 2-1. After the match, I was told that some of our staff had seen Rijkaard approach Frisk in an area which was reserved for match officials only. Mourinho refused to speak at the post-match press conference and what ensued felt like a war waged on Chelsea by UEFA and the media. The club protested that Rijkaard had attempted to influence the referee at half-time and pointed out that Didi had been sent off shortly after play resumed. UEFA were quick to deny the allegation, though Frisk later admitted that he had to ask Rijkaard to leave a restricted area during the break, saying it was neither the place nor the moment to discuss the match. The situation spiralled out of control when Frisk then announced his retirement from refereeing, claiming he'd received threats to himself and his family. UEFA's media chief, William Gaillard, popped up in the English media more times than Tony Blair as he slagged off Mourinho and Chelsea, while another UEFA official, Volker Roth, labelled our manager an enemy of football. It was a full-scale crusade against us. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe that people in positions of responsibility would willfully inflame the situation in such an unnecessary way. Just as damaging was the way the English media fanned the campaign. I could never imagine the press in Spain or Italy siding with UEFA against one of their major clubs. It would have been nice if people had defended us, but no one was even prepared to entertain the idea that we had a genuine grievance. To say we were fired up for the second game is an understatement. That simmering sense of injustice is one reason why we exploded out of the blocks and were three up after 26 minutes. After everything that had gone before, it felt like we were in dreamland. A minute later, Ronaldinho brought us firmly back to earth with a penalty before reality kicked us even harder when he scored a magnificent second. What had been billed as the most competitive meeting of the season, was beginning to look like a free-for-all. For all our audacity, though, scoring three against Barca meant nothing, because we were out on away goals at that point. It took JT to stretch his full height and strength to head a dramatic winner in the final minutes to get us into the quarter-final and strike a blow for natural justice. We were delirious. Well, I was along with everyone at Chelsea, though there were a few long Catalan faces around our house that night. Ellen's wasn't one of them. She is Chelsea now and supports me ahead of her hometown club. We had progressed, but at a price. Mourinho was banned from the technical area for the tie against Bayern Munich because of his comments about Rijkaard and Frisk, but if UEFA's intention was to smack us back into line, then they had another thing coming. We were more determined than ever to fly in the face of the establishment and Bayern were as much a part of the ruling classes as any club in Europe. The match at the bridge is one of the best I played that season. We were all fired up for it. The manager gave his pre-match talk the night before the game, but he didn't use the situation to try to motivate us. He didn't need to. Speculation about where Mourinho would watch the action from threatened to turn our biggest game of the season into a circus of photographers balancing on the back of motorcycles. It degenerated further when a conspiracy theory was hatched shortly after kick-off that Rui Farrier was concealing some kind of communication device under a woolly hat. Why not just go the whole hog and claim that Mourinho himself was hiding under there? The truth is that the boss didn't need to be on the bench or even in the stand. When we're on the pitch, he's always with us, in every move we make and every kick we take. We knew he was watching somewhere, and hopefully he liked what he saw. We were a bit stuck at one all, and slightly concerned at having conceded an away goal. However, a chance fell slightly behind me, but I managed to dig it out from 20 yards and beat Oliver Kahn to regain the lead. Nice one, but I wasn't finished yet.
Maka flighted a pass towards me, and as I tracked the flight of the ball, I realised it was a fraction too high to take on my chest. The angle wasn't great, and I could sense a defender was closing me down. I had a choice. Either I attempt an overhead kick, or I allow it to drop over my shoulder and onto my left foot. Probably two of the most difficult moves to execute in football, though an easy way of making a complete tit of yourself. I opted for the second, and caught the ball beautifully on the volley to smash it into the net. Not bad for my weaker foot. It's one of my favourite goals for Chelsea, and though I don't normally keep boots, I've reserved a special place at home for the pair I wore that night. The game finished 4-2, and we went on to battle to an aggregate victory in Munich to make the semi-final for the second year in a row. It was quite an achievement. Even the media had begun to pay us some grudging respect, though I have to say that the relationship between us and the press is not all bad. We stayed in Munich the night of the match, and a couple of lads from the papers joined the players for a beer afterwards. They were buying. Cheers, Dan. Having been knocked out of the FA Cup at Newcastle in February meant we had a week to prepare to play Arsenal at home in the Premiership. Victory would put us 14 points ahead with five games to play. And while the title wouldn't be ours mathematically, it would be a fitting way to celebrate its inevitability. It wasn't to be. A goalless draw left us needing six points, and all of a sudden the manager could add astrology to his impressive list of talents. Earlier in the campaign, he predicted that Chelsea would win the championship on the 30th of April, when we would play away at Bolton. After we beat Fulham, only Spurs could scupper his emerging rivalry with Russell Grant. Victory over Arsenal would hand us the title without kicking a ball, and we all gathered in La Familia restaurant to watch their match. The manager had decided we should spend the two nights before the first leg of the Champions League semi-final against Liverpool in the Chelsea Village Hotel, so it was a short hop on the Monday night. Roman brought some huge pots of the finest Russian caviar for us to eat. I loved the stuff and was tucking in while most of the lads looked at me strangely. I reckon they were worth about five grand a pot and I was glad for the good food given how bland the game was. Arsenal were ahead for a while and then Robbie Keane had a header in the last few minutes. We all jumped up instinctively but I was quite relieved when it flashed past the post. I didn't want to win the league in a restaurant on the King's Road. I'd waited all my life for that moment, and no amount of Russia's finest caviar would have made up for missing out on being on the pitch and actually celebrating the victory as a football team. I lay in bed, thinking about what was ahead. In the next eight days, we could clinch the Premiership and qualify for the Champions League final. Again, not bad for a boring team from West London. The first leg of the semi against Liverpool didn't quite match the ties against Barca and Bayern in terms of goals, though the Battle of Britain was thrilling as a contest. The return leg was no less enervating. The crowd at Anfield is so vocal and intense that it feels like they're directly above the pitch screaming on top of you rather than filling its sides. Maybe we got caught in the moment because we allowed our guard to slip early and conceded the now infamous goal that never was. I've heard and read people say that Chelsea should stop whining about Garcia's effort, that it doesn't matter if the ball crossed the line or not because the referee gave a goal. Oh, really? My reply is simple. If you'd worked as hard as we had to reach that stage of the Champions League, then you would feel a right to protest as well. In fact, if we had scored that goal and not Liverpool, I wonder how their players would have reacted. No differently, I suspect. We did everything to try and redeem the situation. Piled on pressure, players up front, and tried everything we knew to break them down. When the ball fell to Ida in the final minute, within yards of the goal, I thought we had them. One hit, Ida. One hit. His volley was true, and it flashed across Dudek's goal, and Jamie Carragher got a touch on it at the far post to make sure it didn't go in. The whistle sounded and I felt a surge of anger well up in me. To get to one semi-final and lose to Monaco the year before was unlucky, 
to be involved in another the following season seemed unjust. I tried to make sense of it. After all, they were struggling to qualify for the Champions League while we were busy trying to wrap up Chelsea's first league championship in 50 years. We'd beaten Liverpool twice in the Premiership, so why couldn't we in Europe? No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't work it out. All I was certain of was how low I felt at the result. I hate losing. I really hate it. Conceding the title was not possible, and in between the European matches we had a pressing date in Bolton, and her name was Destiny. As we travelled north, I remembered some of the things that had been said to me in the previous weeks about winning the league. It seemed that everywhere I went, I ran into Chelsea fans, all of whom were eager to let me know what the title meant to them. It had been 50 years since Chelsea won the league. 50 long years. And even though I'd only been with the club for a fraction of that time, I felt the same pent-up frustration as the fans about waiting any longer. I knew what it meant to them because of what it meant to me. We stayed at the Preston Marriott, and the night before the game, I threw the question out as I was sitting with John and Ida, chilling out. Imagine what it would be like to score the goal that wins the league. We were silent as the thought drifted out there. I wasn't trying to preempt anything, but it was something I'd thought about, dreamt about, for much of my life, and this was the first time I'd been in a position where it was a possibility. The journey from our hotel to the Reebok was full of nervous excitement. As always, I sat with JT, Ida and Bill Blood, and I blurted out the same question I had the night before. What would it be like? Come on. Come on. The adrenaline began to flow, and when we arrived at the stadium, we were all pumped and ready to go. You imagine you'll be infallible in situations like that, that when the hand of fate beckons you towards glory, nothing can trip you up. That is, until you go for the warm-up and find a pitch that looks like a cow field. Bolton are hard enough to play at home. A bad pitch in the freezing cold just complicates it. They carved out their normal game, and Kevin Nolan was flicking things on, and they made a couple of half chances. We barely responded in the first half. We seemed to be seizing up in the bitter wind and allowing our grip on history to slip. The half-time team talk was designed to breathe some fire back into us. We were expecting a bollocking, but the manager's anger was turned into a question. We are not playing well, but we are not doing too badly, he said. Why? I don't understand. Keep it simple. Play the way you can, and you'll succeed. Before, we had 90 minutes to win the league, and now we have 45 now go and do it. He was right. We hadn't worked this hard or come this far to let ourselves down. I felt renewed energy in my legs and a surge of confidence, similar to when the manager had told me I was the best player in the world. I heard his voice in my head. You need to prove that and win trophies. Now was my chance. Now was our chance to prove we were the best. Didi cushioned the ball across to me, but Vincent Candela blocked my sight of goal. I looked up for options, but no one was in space. To hell with it. I'll have a go. I dropped my shoulder and got the half yard I needed for the angle to drive my shot past UC Yaskalainen. Goal! 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 I spun away and ran, shouting with every pace. I made a bolt for our fans at the other side of the box. Mum and Dad couldn't get tickets for the director's area, and somewhere in the blue bedlam they were celebrating the same as me. The lads smothered me with hugs, and I had to fight them off to see some daylight. This was it. This was what it felt like to be a winner. My heart was still pounding when minutes later I found myself in acres and acres of space. It was surreal, like a dream. I was just running running like I would never get to the goal or the mass of blue and white who were standing on their toes behind it. I could see Ricky pushing on beside me, shouting for a pass. I pretended not to hear. I was determined to finish it off. Dad was sitting behind the goal, and when I got to the edge of the box, he was shouting, Shoot! Shoot! 
I couldn't hear him, because another voice in my head was telling me I should go round Jaskalainen and roll it in. Not my normal type of finish, but stylish, and if you're going to win the league, then what better way to do it? It took a few seconds for the rest of the lads to catch me up, but they got there soon enough. It's hard to describe exactly what I felt just then. Difficult, because extreme emotions don't fit into words very comfortably. Elation is too temporary. This was more substantial, and I can still feel it now when I close my eyes and relive that moment. Everything that came afterwards was fantastic. It was everything I imagined it to be, and more. We soaked Roman with champagne, then went back to the pitch and took him with us. There wasn't a lot of sensible conversation between us. He'd lived every minute of that season, and he deserved to take his share of the credit. He hadn't just pumped money in and sat back waiting for things to happen. He helped make it happen, and he loved being out there with us. I looked around for the manager, and saw him sitting quietly in the dugout. He phoned his family, spoke to his wife and children, and was happy to have shared part of the moment with them. While the rest of us carried on like loonies on the pitch, outside the stadium, John and I got our heads out of the top of the bus to sing with the hundreds of fans who'd waited to see us. We were among them, and that was a special moment. I knew how important it was, and it meant at least as much to them, and maybe more. The celebration back at the hotel was very muted by comparison. We would play the second leg of the semi-final in the Champions League at Anfield on the Wednesday, so we had a couple of beers with our dinner while it began to sink in. We were the Premiership champions. I was still buzzing with the adrenaline of the game and the goals, but sat down with Ida and we had a beer and watched the game on match of the day. I could hardly believe what I was watching. I could see myself on the screen: me, Ida, John, Coley, Big Pete, Ricky. Jeremy, Tiago, Maka, Didi. I scored one, then another. It was like watching a dream, your own dream, there for everyone to see, and it was perfect, absolutely perfect. Losing to Liverpool three days later meant we failed by a whisker to make the European Cup final for a second consecutive season. I hate losing. I really hate it. We'd won two trophies, though, and in claiming the league, we'd proved ourselves to be the best team in England. A couple of weeks later, I picked up an individual prize when I was voted the Football Writers Association Player of the Year. It was a great honour, and the evening was made all the more special because I was able to share it with my family and friends, the people who mean most to me, those who've changed my life and helped me get to the point in my career that I'd yearned for more than anything else. Jose Mourinho is part of that special group, though unlike him, I would never tout myself as the best player in the world. Among the best in England, yes, I think I've proven that.